your entertainment and pleasure, here is Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks under the direction of Al Lewis. Well, the flames of anger that scorch the soul of a spurned woman just don't seem to flicker so violently in the male animal. As a Cracker Barrel poet once put it, quote, men don't see red like jilted ladies until they drop dead and visit Hades. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, expresses the same thought, but on a much higher literary plane. Quote, nothing to me is so disappointing as to get stood up by Mr. Boynton. <laughs> Unquote, new paragraph. Last Wednesday night, Mr. Boynton called off a date we had. But the next day, he made me forget all about it by calling off the date we had for Thursday night. <laughs> and Friday morning, my landlady greeted me at the breakfast table with another pleasant surprise. I thought you might be sick of scrambled eggs, Connie, so I fixed you something different for breakfast today. Oh, what is it, Mrs. Davis? Chicken charming. <laughs> Chicken chow mein instead of scrambled eggs? Oh, don't let that bother you, Connie. We can have the scrambled eggs for dinner. <laughs> now, drink your fruit juice cocktail, dear. I mixed it for you myself. What's in it, I'm afraid? <laughs> Just the usual healthy combination. Orange juice, a bottle of real lemon juice, some grapefruit juice, and... Just a smidgen of yogurt. If you don't mind, I'll have just a smidgen of bicarbonate. <laughs> Toast and coffee will be plenty for me this morning, Mrs. Davis. Well, I guess I could save your charmaine until dinner time. Oh, thanks, but I won't be home this evening. You see, when Mr. Boynton canceled our date last night, he promised he'd make it up to me tonight. He said we'd have dinner out. Oh, that's nice. Where is he taking you, dear? Harrigan's Hamburger Heaven. <laughs> Connie, that's just a little open-air stand in the park. Well, that's one thing about Mr. Boynton. When he says we're eating out, we eat out. <laughs> Honestly, if he weren't such a handsome devil... I... Oh, that reminds me. <laughs> Before you came in, I was reading an item in the school paper that might interest you. In the monitor? What is it, Mrs. Davis? Well, I've got it right here. It's in Walter Denton's new gossip column. Here, read it. Let's see. Campus dirt shoveled by Walter Denton. <laughs> My first exclusive. What female English teacher is that way about what certain handsome biology teacher... Your reporter has purposely omitted any name so as to cause no embarrassment to either Mr. Boynton or Miss Brooks. <laughs> well, I should have expected this invasion of privacy. Ever since Walter took over that gossip column, he's had his ear to more keyholes than a house detective. If you think that's bad, read the next item. It says, my second exclusive. What other lady English teacher is also that way about the same biology instructor? Incidentally, her birthday falls on March 16th, and some of her intimate friends are giving this anonymous lady teacher a birthday party. Many happy returns to you, Miss Daisy Enright. <laughs> so Miss Enright's having a birthday, hmm? On March 16th. Why, that's tonight, Connie. Oh, well, so it is. I wish I'd known that when we were in the cafeteria yesterday. I could have given her something. Like what, Connie? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I could have slipped something into her coffee. <laughs> you shouldn't feel such animosity toward Miss Enright, Connie. She speaks very highly of you. Why, she paid you a lovely compliment when I met her in the grocer's the other day. What did she say? She said you have the most interesting figure of any woman she knows. Miss Enright said that? Absolutely. Then she said that you always look like you're wearing a girdle, even when you are. <laughs> well, now I know I'll have to get her a birthday present. The trouble is, I'm torn between two gifts. What are they, Connie? I don't know whether to buy her a pound of liver or a nice tender canary. <laughs> oh, incidentally, Connie, before I blend it with the topsoil in the backyard, are you sure you don't want to taste this charming... I've never been so dead certain of anything in my life. 
Besides, I've got to rush down to school. I'd like to get there early so Mr. Boynton and I can discuss the plans for our super special date tonight. What's so special about tonight, Connie? Well, tomorrow's Saturday, Mrs. Davis, and there's no school, so we don't have to get up early in the morning. Consequently, Friday is the one night Mr. Boynton really lets his hair down. He pulls out all the stops and doesn't give a hoot about getting home to sleep until 10 p.m. <laughs> Well, good morning, Miss Brooks. Why, Mr. Boynton, what a surprise to see you here. Surprise? This is my biology lab, Miss Brooks. <laughs> well, what do you know about that? And I thought I was stepping into a phone booth. <laughs> well, anyway, now that I'm here, what's new? Well, I had a very interesting chat a few minutes ago with Miss Enright. I'll rephrase the question. What's old besides Miss Enright? <laughs> It's her birthday, and we were reminiscing about the party she threw on her last birthday. I was her escort on that occasion, if you recall. Vividly. That was the night I went to see a reissue of This Gun for Hire. <laughs> oh, it certainly was a great party. We had an eight-course dinner, and then everybody got noisemakers and favors, and well, along about nine o'clock, I got to feeling real gay. I, I remember I put one of the lampshades on my head and made believe it was a woman's hat. Sounds like a real wingding. <laughs> now, but let's turn to a more pleasant subject, Mr. Boynton, about our date for tonight. Oh, oh Miss Enright reminded me about something else this morning, Miss Brooks. It, it's very funny how it happened. <laughs> I just know you'll scream when you hear it. <laughs> what is it? Well, when I was at Miss Enright's party last year, she had so much fun, she asked me to promise I'd escort her again next year, but it completely skipped my mind until she reminded me of it this morning, and that's why I can't take you out tonight. <laughs> See, I told you. No, if you'll excuse me, Miss Brooks, I've got to go into the back room for a minute. I've given my frogs and guinea pigs some breakfast now. Not so fast, Mr. Boynton. There's something we've got to discuss. Oh, but the frogs and guinea pigs must be finished by now. I've got to clean up their dishes. Well, let the frogs wash and the pigs dry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Brooks, but I've got to get things straightened out before my first class. If you want to wait for me, I'll be back in a few minutes. Don't worry, I'll be here. You'll recognize me by my white lips. Now make it snappy. Very well, Miss Brooks. Fine kettle of frogs this is. Of all the unmitigated nerve. I... I love life and I want to live. <laughs> oh, it's you. Well, good morning, Miss Enright. Why, Miss Brooks, I'm glad you spoke up, darling. I was about to hang my coat on you. <laughs> Go right ahead, dear. Then I'll hang one on you. Uh, there'll be a short wait for Mr. Boynton. He's been feeding the livestock. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your breakfast. <laughs> but then I shouldn't tease you on this of all days. You know, congratulations are in order. <laughs> I'm 24 years old today. 24. <laughs> well, I can't blame you for being a trifle more bitter than you are normally. After all, Mr. Boynton did have to break a date with you so he could escort me to the party tonight. But remember, darling, this is a special occasion. After all, I don't have a birthday every day. Oh, I know. You just look that way. <laughs> You're such a doll. <laughs> well, what I had to say to Mr. Boynton can wait until later. I've got to get back to my classroom now. Just tell him I'll see him after a bit, Miss Brooks. And give him my love. I'll tell him you'll see him later. <laughs> On second thought, I may not wait to tell him anything. If he thinks I'm going to jump at him every time he calls my name, he's got another thing coming. Oh, Miss Brooks. Oh, here I am, Mr. Boynton, right here. What can I do for you? What is it? What can I do? Hmm? Yes? What can I do? 
Miss Brooks, I can't tell you how miserable I am about having to call off our appointment for tonight. Oh, let's not discuss it, Mr. Boynton. As you always say, we'll make up for it tomorrow night. Well, now, I don't know about that, Miss Brooks. You see, <laughs> another funny thing happened. I'll bet it's a riot. <laughs> well, my mother's visiting some friends in Ferndale. As you know, that's only a hundred miles from here, as the crow flies. Maybe she'll... <laughs> I meant, what has that got to do with tomorrow night? Well, in the letter I got from Mom yesterday, she said she's going to drop over to see me in a couple of days, which probably means tomorrow, although she'll wire me about the exact time. And when she comes to town, I'll have to call off all dates and spend every night with her. Well, I seem to have hit the jackpot this morning. I might as well get to my classroom. Well, goodbye, Miss Brooks. Bye. I heard absolutely nothing, Miss Brooks. Walter Denton, was your ear to that keyhole... Absolutely not. Cross my heart and hope to die. And I think it's a dirty shame for Mr. Boynton to dust you off for Miss Enright. <laughs> well, now that you know the story of my life, you also know that there's nothing I can do about it. Well, that's where you're wrong. While I was listening, I was thinking. And I've got a plan that's absolutely foolproof. All it needs is the cooperation of an old pal of mine named Mel Norman. Mel Norman? Yeah, you remember him. He graduated from Madison last year. But before he got out, he used to shovel the dirt for the gossip column I've got now. Oh, now I remember. He's the slimy little boy who got the black sheepskin at commencement. <laughs> What's your plan, Walter? Listen, Miss Brooks. First of all, Mel now lives in Ferndale, where Mr. Boynton's mother is visiting friends. Secondly, Mr. B made it clear that he'll call off all dates when his mother gets to town. So? So, all I have to do is make a little phone call to Mel... Tell him to send a wire to Mr. Boynton from Ferndale, signed Mother, and saying that she'll arrive in town tonight. Upon receipt of said wire, Mr. Boynton will immediately cancel his date with Miss Enright and sit home to await Mama. Go on. Mr. Boynton will not wait alone, because you'll be sitting there with him, ostensibly to keep him company until the arrival of the dear little lady who just isn't going to show up. Uh -huh. In conclusion, all I ask is that you give me one measly buck to cover the cost of the phone and telegram from Mel. Well, Miss Brooks, what do you think of the scheme? Walter Denton, that is without a doubt the sneakiest, foulest, and most deplorable scheme I ever heard of. Here's the buck. <laughs> The Influence of NATO. World War II, the nations of the West took action to prevent World War III. They formed a common defensive shield called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And in the intervening two decades, NATO did what it was designed to do. It has succeeded, enabling the nations to learn from each other, to earn from each other, to live together. In years to come, NATO's scope may widen. It may stand not only as a defensive shield, but also as an influence against the threat to our environment. Yes, on the important ecological, non-military problems of our industrial civilization, the influence of NATO may continue to help us to live together. Shortly before first class, Walter Denton slithered into a phone booth, called his henchman in Ferndale, and got him to send the wire telling Mr. Boynton his mother would arrive that evening. By noon, I was anxious to find out if Mr. Boynton had received the wire, so I headed for the cafeteria at a rather rapid rate. As I jogged past the principal's office, however, Mr. Conklin opened the door, and in the warm and friendly voice he reserves for his favorites on the faculty, he addressed me. Halt! Yes, sir I was just on my way you to the... You don't have to tell me, Miss Brooks Every day as I sit in my office during the noon hour Some secret sense tells me the exact moment That you are passing by on your way to see Mr. Boynton I don't understand Well, it's relatively simple First there comes the sound of a violent rush of air After that, my windows rattle the shades fly up, my desk quivers, and I topple off my swivel chair. Now, really, Mr. Compton, you... Dad, how I wish we could use you on our track team. 
but permit me to explain my reason for flagging you down. A telegram came to my office a few moments ago, and I thought you might enjoy delivering it. It's for, for Mr. Mr. Boynton? Boynton? Yes. Oh, just hand it over, sir. I'll deliver it immediately. Don't worry about a thing. I'll get it to Mr. Boynton in no time at all. Just leave the whole thing to me, and I'll get it Down, right girl, down. <laughs> <laughs> May I have it now, Mr. Conklin? Here you are, Miss Brooks. Thank you. I'll just... Oh, well, that's funny. The back flap of the envelope seems to be quite wrinkled and damp, as if it had been steamed open. Steamed open? Well, um, it must have been lying too close to the radiator. Yes, sir. Can I get you a better bandage for that hand, Mr. Conklin? <laughs> I closed the door on it at home. Miss Brooks, I resent your inference that I would open anyone else's message. A man of my integrity does not pry into the affairs of others. Naturally not, sir. What did it say? It says I'm arriving tonight. It says... How do I know what it says? <laughs> now, take that thing to Mr. Moynton. And Miss Brooks, I'm going to be tied up in my office for a while, so please stop at the steam table and get me a hot turkey sandwich and bring it back immediately. Immediately, sir. And Mr. Conklin? Yes? Won't it be nice to have Mr. Boynton's mother in town for a while? Go ahead and open your telegram, Mr. Boynton. Thanks. I don't get many telegrams. I wonder who... Oh, Miss Brooks, guess who this is from. Well, if it's from your mother, it's certainly news to me. It is from my mother, Miss Brooks. Now, listen to this. I am arriving tonight at Union Station. Not necessary you pick me up, just... Oh, that's strange. These words seem sort of blurred and damp. It was delivered by a very hot-handed messenger boy. <laughs> the rest of the sentence probably reads, just wait for me at home. Well, let's see. Yes, that's what it says. How did you know, Miss Brooks? What more logical place could one wait for one's mother but in one's own apartment? Oh, my goodness, this means I'll have to break my date with Miss Enright. Gosh, in view of my... <laughs> in view of my promise, it isn't going to be easy for me to tell her she'll have to go to her party without me. I'm sure you appreciate the spot I'm in, Miss Brooks. Appreciate it? I'm crazy about it. <laughs> I mean, it's positively sickening. <laughs> I haven't felt so miserable since I got a $40 tax rebate from the government. Oh, you shouldn't make light of the situation, Miss Brooks. After all, it is Miss Enright's birthday. She might not be able to comprehend my apparent desertion at a time like this. Believe me, Mr. Boynton, it won't be a new experience for her. Miss Enright has been deserted by more men than a leaky battleship. <laughs> now, just think of your mother and cheer up. You'll be overjoyed to see her tonight, I'm sure, and so will I. You? Naturally. If I weren't on hand to welcome your dear mother, I'd never forgive myself. Oh, I had no idea you were so fond of Mom, Miss Brooks. Fond of her? Mr. Boynton, I wouldn't know what to do without her. Especially tonight. <laughs> Remember her last visit? Remember how she loved playing checkers with me? I'll be over about seven, and we'll wait for her together. Well, the wire doesn't say what time she'll arrive. We may have quite a long wait. I'm a rugged sort, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> I'll stick it out with you if it takes all month. All right, that is a nice gesture on your part to keep me company, Miss Brooks. You know, when you come right down to it, you're a pretty good scout. Thanks. I'll bring my Bowie knife. <laughs> Maybe we can whittle some notches on your sofa. Well, now that everything's settled, I've, I've got to get Mr. Conklin a sandwich. See you tonight, Mr. Boynton. All right, Miss Brooks. I've been wanting to show you my new apartment. I think you'll like it. Oh, I'm sure we will. Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. It's apartment 208, Miss Brooks, on the second floor. I'll find it. Just leave Miss Enright burning in the window for me. <laughs> Hi, Miss Brooks. Oh, hello, Harriet. I was just about to get a sandwich for your dad. Oh, yes, he told me. I just left his office. Incidentally, Miss Brooks, as I was walking down the hall, I bumped into Miss Enright. It's hard not to. <laughs> what did the Elsa Maxwell of Madison have to say? Well, she told me that Mr. Boynton is taking her to a birthday party tonight. I had no idea she was so young. She says she's only 24 years old. Why, well, I doubt her. No matter how old she says she is now, in a few minutes she'll be eligible for Social Security. <laughs> I'd explain that, Harriet, but I'd better pick up your dad's lunch. Okay, Miss Brooks. I've got an errand to do myself. 
See you later, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Harriet. Oh, there you are. I have a message for you, Mr. Boynton. Oh, what is it, Harriet? Daddy stepped out of his office a little while ago, and while I was minding it, a long-distance call came from Ferndale for you. From Ferndale? Yes, it was your mother. She said to be sure and tell you she's arriving in town tonight. But I just received a wire saying... <laughs> That's Mom for you. I guess she wanted to make doubly certain I'd stay home tonight. My, what a lovely apartment this is, Mr. Boynton. I'm glad you like it, Miss Brooks. Those French doors next to the fireplace, where do they lead? The fire escape. It'll be, be great fun. Great for sunbathing. My only regret is that I don't have an extra bedroom. When Mom arrives, I'll have to sleep right here on this couch. Well, don't rehearse now. <laughs> it's a very comfy couch, Mr. Boynton, but <laughs> it's rather wide. Why don't you edge over a bit closer to me? Oh, please, Miss Brooks. We're already sitting so close together, I, I could almost reach over and touch you. <laughs> Don't knock it till you've tried it. <laughs> we really should have a gay time tonight, Mr. Boynton. See what's on the coffee table? I've made some punch. Just enough for the two of us. For the two of us? Yes, a gallon and a half. <laughs> gallon and a half? When you want more, just holler. <laughs> I think you'll like it, Mr. Boynton. There's nothing in it but fresh fruit juices. Well, in that case, I will have a snort. <laughs> Say, you, you've put a lot of fruit in the bowl, too, haven't you? Peaches, pears. Oh, boy, this ought to hit the right spot. I need something to cool me off. Yes, sir. You're just a ball of fire tonight, Swifty. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Boynton. Drink up. Here goes. <coughs> well, what, what did you put in this punch besides fruit, Miss Brooks? I cannot tell a lie. I spiked it with a smidgen of yogurt. <laughs> I hope it isn't too much for you, Miss uh, Boynton. Come in. It's me, Mr. Boynton. Oh, Miss Enright. Good evening, Miss Enright. Well, I knew you were expecting your mother, Mr. Boynton, but you didn't say anything about your grandmother coming. <laughs> Yes, it is, Miss Enright. And now that you're here, why don't you let me hang your coat and you in the closet? <laughs> well, I can't stay but a moment. Goodbye. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I told Miss Enright how you volunteered to sit with me until Mom showed up. Yes, he certainly did, darling. And only minutes ago, I was struck with such a brilliant thought that I simply had to drop over and pelt you with it. You see, Miss Brooks, Mr. Boynton also told me how famously you and Mrs. Boynton get along. So when she arrives, I thought it'd be nice if Mr. Boynton were to join me at my birthday party, leaving you here to cut up old touches. There are some new ones I've got to attend to first. <laughs> well, of course, if you mind staying with Mr. Boynton's mother. Mind? Well, Miss Brooks loves my mother. And Mom says there's no one she'd rather play checkers with. Right, Miss Brooks? Right as rain, Mr. B. Miss Enright, if, I mean, when his mother arrives, Mr. Boynton will join you at your party. In the meantime, it isn't polite to keep your other guests waiting. You're right at last, darling. Au revoir, mon cher. See you later, Miss Enright. I'll be waiting, dear Mr. Boynton. Don't hold your breath, dear Miss Enright. <laughs> oh, it'll be kind of nice to get out to a party tonight after all. When I think of the laughs you and Mom are going to have... Oh, say, I'd better get out the old checkerboard for you. Don't waste your energy, Mr. Boynton. Oh, it's no trouble. I'll set it right up by the punch bowl. I hope Mom gets here soon. The night is practically over. I know. It's ten minutes past eight. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Mr. Boynton, there is a possibility that Miss Enright's party may be over by the time your mother arrives. So I suggest that we kick back the rugs, put on some dance records, and have our own little party. <laughs> say, that's not a bad idea, Miss Brooks. Give me another glass of that punch and... Let's live a little. <laughs> Come in. Fill up my boy. A mother. And Connie Brooks. <laughs> Miss Brooks, what 
are you doing with that punch bowl? Just pushing the fruit aside before I dive in. <laughs> Brooks returns in just a moment. What, what greater, greater or, or better, better gift, gift can we offer, offer the Republic, Republic than to teach and instruct, instruct our youth? The United States. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mrs. Boynton was so eager to renew her feud with her old checker pigeon that she literally swept her son out of his apartment and off to the birthday party. That left Mama, a checkboard, and me. Let's see now. After I jump your king... Uh, one minute, Mrs. Boynton. I hope you'll forgive my curiosity, but as I recall, you weren't planning on coming to town until tomorrow. I've been wondering what prompted you to change your mind. Well, now, I'll tell you. It was power of suggestion. Power of suggestion? Exactly, Miss Brooks. I had lunch today at the Ferndale Cafe with a lady who works for the telegraph company there, and she told me that a wire had been sent from her office addressed to a Mr. Boynton. Go on. Well, I convinced her that she must have been wrong about the name. But the wire was from some boy's mother, and that's when I said to myself, why not visit Philip tonight? So you see, Miss Brooks, if it hadn't been for that wire, I'd still be at Ferndale. Now... <laughs> move, is it? We each have a jump coming, Mrs. Boynton. We have? Yes. You're going to jump my king, and I'm going to jump off the fire escape. Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, was produced by Larry Burns and directed by Al Lewis. Written by Arthur Allsberg with the music of Lud Bluskin. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. This program came to you from the Frankfurt studios of the American Forces Network Europe and was prepared for rebroadcast over this network by specialist Ed Barron. Ed Barron.